Our scripture reading is taken from Psalm 78. Psalm 78. It'd be nice to read the whole psalm. Obviously, that isn't possible. It's a very lengthy psalm. The main part of the psalm is the vow of parents and grandparents to teach their children. And then what follows is what they will teach them, the history of the church. We will read the first part of the psalm, and you're welcome to read the rest of it at home later today or this week, explaining what we will teach our children. Psalm 78, give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and His strength, and His wonderful works that He hath done. For He established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. It might not be as their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Then what follows is a record of the history of Israel We will end our reading there this morning at verse 8, and then turn also to Psalm 93. Psalm 93. We have sung a number of psalms that have this very idea in it, but notice the emphasis on the power and authority of God. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, for ever. There ends our scripture reading this morning on the basis of this and many other passages of God's Word is the instruction of the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 39. Lord's Day 39 explains the fifth commandment addressed to the children and the youth of the congregation. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now the Catechism in question 104 asks, What doth God require in the fifth commandment? And the answer, that I show all honor, love, and fidelity to my father and mother, and all in authority over me and submit myself to their good instruction and correction with due obedience, and also patiently bear with their weaknesses and infirmities, since it pleases God to govern us by their hand. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the fifth commandment, God speaks a word to the children and the teenagers of faith, Protestant, Reformed Church. Oh, I know it's not exclusively for the children and the youth of this congregation because the Catechism says, everyone in authority over us, and we all have authorities. A wife has her husband, and the husband has his boss, and we all have the authorities of the land. We have elders in the church. We all have authorities, but nonetheless, it's addressed first to the children 
and the teenagers of this congregation. And that's a beautiful thing that God has a commandment addressed specifically to you as children and as the youth. It's beautiful because it means it's a reminder to you that you as children and covenant youth are included in the church and covenant of God. And I can demonstrate that. Recall how the law begins. The law begins, I am the Lord, thy God, who has brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, if all the laws had no reference to you as children, you would think, well, that's for my mom and dad. That's for my grandpa and grandma. That's not for me. But God makes it plain that when He says, I am the Lord thy God, by calling attention in commandment 5 that He speaks a word to you as children, He is saying, I am your God. I am your God. You are in the church and covenant of God. I love you. I love you. That's God's word to you as children. I exhort you, therefore, as children and covenant youth, do not look at the fifth commandment as a hard commandment. One that's difficult to obey. One that becomes kind of a yoke that you have to wear around your neck. And now it has to govern you in a, in a bad way. Notice even that the commandment itself is one of the only two in the entire law that, gives, that is given in a positive way. Eight of the commandments start out, Thou shalt not, because God is saying to, to us, I know that you are prone to this sin. And now I'm coming to you with a command. Do not. And God could have come to the children also with this command and say, Now, don't disobey your parents. Or really, stop disobeying your parents. But He doesn't do that. He comes in a positive way. And that's the way we should look at it. A positive command that not only shows what's pleasing to Him, but shows us the way of greatest covenant blessing. The greatest covenant blessing. And the only way we'll experience a covenant blessing is in the way of honoring father and mother. This commandment that this is first in the second table of the law, first table dealing with how we are to behave toward God, and the second, what duties we owe to to God as far as the neighbor is concerned. This is the first of all the that second table. It indicates, first of all, the importance of it. This is an important command. We might think it's far more important that we do not lie or do not kill or whatever the other commandments, but this is first. When you start to look at what does God require of me As far as my neighbor is concerned, this is first. This is most important. And in fact, if we do not keep this commandment, we will not keep any of them. Not any of them that follow. We will not. And that's obvious even from a practical point of view. It's our parents and those in authority over us that teach us the way that is right. That will show us that the other commandments must be kept. And if we will not keep this commandment of honoring father and mother, then the rest of them we will never Never keep. This Lord's Day also reveals something about God. All the commandments do. And this reveals that God is the one who rules. He has all authority. He has the right to tell us what to do. And now He gives us authorities over us. But He maintains the authority in all of life. Parents, elders, even presidents have authority only because God gives it to them. As we examine this commandment in this Lord's Day from the point of view of the covenant, we will notice two things especially. 
Surely there are more, but at least this. God gives parents to us as children for the sake of His covenant. Now that's pretty obvious maybe because we have covenant families and we have parents and we have children. That's, that's part of the covenant. But He gives authorities all authorities, teachers, elders, even the rulers of the land for the sake of His covenant. Some advance the covenant deliberately and others God uses to protect His covenant people the rulers of the land. But He gives authority for the sake of His covenant. Secondly, the enjoyment of covenant blessings come only in the way of keeping this commandment. You will not enjoy the covenant if you refuse to obey father and mother. It's obvious that this is a fitting commandment as we consider to, to consider as we have witnessed the beautiful sacrament of infant baptism. Because this is a Lord's Day and this is a sermon addressed first and foremost to all of you children and to all of the teenagers, the children, the youth of this congregation. We'll notice in this then under the theme, we'll take as the theme of this honoring authority as covenant people we as covenant people honor authority we'll notice in the first place that it's a god-given authority secondly that respect for that is god glorifying and that's what we must do give a respect to authority that glorifies god and then thirdly that there is grace necessary and that's something god gives us too to keep this commandment. So we will honor all authority as a covenant people. And to understand that, we begin with this, that God is the one who gives authority. He gives authority to your parents. To say that God gives authority and that God gives us parents is really only due to the fact that God is God. He's God over all, absolutely sovereign and ruling over all things. And all authority and power is God's. That's what we sang more than once this morning, and that's what we just read here in Psalm 93. All authority is God's. He rules in heaven, and He rules over all the affairs of men. Authority is that. It's the right to rule. It's not, first of all, power, but it's just the right to rule. It's the right to make laws for someone, to make rules for someone. And those rules have to be kept. And someone who has authority has the right then to punish those who do not keep the rules. God has all authority. God has the right over every one of us. From the President of the United States to our parents to the elders of the church, God rules over all. He is God. He was before all things. Psalm 93, verse 2, Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Everything else has a beginning. You have a beginning. I have a beginning. Everything in the world has a beginning. God has no beginning. He is God from eternity. And from eternity, His throne is established. He created everything by the word of His power. They exist by His power. All power is His. God has the right, therefore, to rule. Not merely because He is powerful. Because with God, power and authority are inseparable. You can't, can't take them apart. But God does have authority because He is God. And God does rule too. He rules sovereignly over all things. No one may question God and say, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why, why do I have this terrible tragedy in my life? What are you doing to me? No one may question God. 
He does as He sees fit in heaven and in earth. God demands that everyone in the whole world bow before Him and acknowledge that He is God and that He deserves to be feared and obeyed. You can take what the Catechism says and apply this first of all to God, that I show all honor, love, and fidelity to God. That's what we have to do because He has all authority. He exercises that authority through Jesus Christ. Understand that. God has appointed Christ under Him. Here's God with all authority. He has put Christ under Him to exercise all of God's authority. Christ is head over everything that God has made, including His church and His covenant. God does all things in and through Christ. He doesn't need to, but He chose to do that because as God eternally had this glorious plan, unchangeable plan, His determination was, I will reveal My perfections. I will reveal My perfections to the old people and to the young people and to the children. I want them to know how great I am And I will reveal them through Jesus Christ. You can't see God. You can only see the works that God accomplishes. God would make Himself visible in Jesus Christ so that all of the perfections of God we could see in Jesus, in His work, and in His person. So God determined to do everything through Jesus and to rule also through Jesus Christ over all of the world that He created. God gave all that authority to Christ as a reward, remember, for enduring the agony of the cross. The agony of Jesus on the cross is beyond anything that you and I can even begin to understand. Dreadful suffering that The Son of God, who was God Himself, came into this earth, covered up His glory with the likeness of sinful flesh, with our human flesh. He became utterly poor. He endured the mockery of people. He endured their lies. He was rejected by His own people. He took upon Himself the curse of God willingly when He was nailed to the cross. And there He endured the infinite Wrath of God. Dreadful wrath of God. The beloved Son became cast off by His Father. God only poured out His wrath upon Him. That's all Jesus could see. He couldn't behold any of the love that He had known eternally. He only now knew that killing, horrible wrath of God. God's displeasure and wrath against our sin. Jesus endured hell. Jesus died. Jesus was buried in a cave with a stone rolled in front of it for our sakes. And because He accomplished the salvation of His people, because He fully accomplished everything God sent Him to do, God took Him out of that grave. God took Him out of His humiliation and raised Him. And as low as Jesus had gone down into the depths of hell, so high did God exalt Him as head over all things. Jesus is head over all. He's Lord of lords and King of kings. And you remember, children, when He was about to ascend up into heaven, that He said to His disciples in Matthew 28, All authority is given Me in heaven and in earth. All authority. No one else has authority in all the earth except for Jesus Christ. He gets it all from God and He has every bit of it. All authority is given me, said Jesus, in heaven and in earth. And Jesus gives that authority to whomever He desires. No one deserves any authority. 
No one deserves to have the right to rule over other people. But he gives it. There is no authority in all the earth except it is from Jesus himself. And that's our Savior. That's quite something. The one who saved us is the one who has all authority and gives it to people as he pleases. We know, too, that Christ is the head and mediator of the covenant. So now here's Jesus, our Savior, having all authority, and whatever he does as he rules, he has his eye on the covenant. He has his eye on the church. And everything that he does is for the good of his covenant and for the good of his church. Everything. He never does one thing that would be bad for his church and covenant. Never. And that's why he blesses us children and young people with parents. This is a blessing from Christ in the covenant to have believing parents. To have the believing parents that God has given us. It's not an accident. It's not a chance that you just happen to be born into the family that you are. Your parents got authority from Jesus Christ. And Jesus makes it known what authority they have over which children, either by birth or by adoption. He causes us to know, all right, these parents have authority over me. Christ indicates that. Christ shows these parents have authority over me. Those parents do not. They're not my parents. These are the ones that Jesus shows to me are my rightful authorities. They rule over me. They have the right to make rules for me. They are from God. They are a blessing. And they are a blessing because of what we saw with baptism this morning. Our children, you and I, as children, were born dead in sin. We're prone to every evil way. God knows our sinfulness. And therefore, He puts parents over us. Because He knows we are prone to go the wrong way. We're prone to sin. We need our parents. We cannot go on without them. Now that's indicated even again by the little baby that was born, brought up here today. This morning, when Phil and Laura got up, they had to wake the baby up and feed her and wash her and dress her, him rather, and put him into the car seat and take him into church and carry him up here. Little Seton cannot do one thing for himself, not one thing. We ought to remember that. That's what we need. We need our parents to take care of us from the time that we are young. Not only physically, but it's the spiritual side especially. We need, we need our parents to take care of us from a spiritual point of view. God has given us parents for the sake of His covenant. A covenant that He establishes with us as children. But now, if we are to live with that God in covenant fellowship, we have to know Him. We have to be taught about the beauties of that God. We have to be taught to love that God and to obey that God. We need parents. God has given us parents also that there may be a covenant family. And though that family is imperfect, there's sin there, yet there is in that family some pictures that remind us that God is our Father and we are His children. And therefore, 
Our relationship in our homes is a picture, is an experience of what it is to be children of God. God loves us. He cares for us. And He loves to dwell with us. Parents also teach us to keep the fifth commandment. Parents teach us, but parents sometimes can undo the very work that they teach. They're not always such good examples. Sometimes parents criticize your own authorities, teachers, right in front of you. And then it makes it pretty easy to disobey the teacher when after all mom and dad do not think that he or she is a very good teacher. Sometimes parents, our parents can joke about getting a speeding ticket from authorities or can be sarcastic about a president or can complain about the boss. And that's not a very good example for us children. Sometimes parents can even destroy their own authority. And mothers can contradict father in front of, right, right in front of their children. And fathers can criticize mother and make it plain that they don't think the parents, the children, rather need to honor mother. We do everything that the catechism says we must not do. Parents are not always good examples. But they are to teach us as children to honor all those in authority. To honor them all. Honor parents, honor teachers, honor the elders, honor the rulers of the country as well. Because all those people have their authority from Christ. That's what they must remind us. God gives office bearers in the church for the good of the church. For the sake of the covenant that there may be good order in the church. That the, the truth is preached from the pulpit here. They are to guard that. That all the poor are cared for. God gives these men that authority to care for the church so that we will know God and be able to live in covenant fellowship together as a congregation so that we can have peace and unity and and grow spiritually what a blessing to have elders as well as deacons God gives rulers in the country they are ministers of God for good God gives them the sword to punish the evildoer and God gives them the right and the responsibility to, to reward that which is good so that there may be peace in our country, so that we can worship here today, so that you can read the Bible at home with your parents, so that you can go to school. The government is giving that ability to us by just maintaining good order in society. That's why we are to pray for them. One of the reasons. Even a husband is given authority over his wife for her good. For her spiritual good. And, and as well that there may be right in front of us as children that beautiful picture of the covenant, Christ and His church. Every single believer must honor all those in authority, whether it's parents teachers, elders, or rulers. You see why now? Because their authority comes from Christ. Their authority comes from Christ. And they are acting in the place of Christ. And enjoyment of the covenant in this life is related to obedience to this commandment. That's why they're given to us. And in fact, if we can't live in peace and honor those in authority in this life. How do you think we will ever live in peace and honor Christ? Who gave them that authority. And, and in reality, of course, it's only those who do live in covenant fellowship with God. Who can live in covenant fellowship with their parents. 
with the elders of the church, with their teachers, and even their authorities. Once we get this in, in our mind that authority is from Christ, then it doesn't really matter whether I like the algebra teacher or the history teacher. That's immaterial. Whether I think this is a good teacher or not a good teacher, that, that doesn't matter at all. That's, that's immaterial as far as my honoring that teacher. It doesn't matter whether I voted for the president or would have voted if I could. That, that doesn't matter. It's authority from Christ that we honor. And therefore, we must. That's the only way that you can begin to have the proper respect. That's the second thing we want to look at, a God-glorifying respect. The Catechism says, how do you keep this commandment? That I show all honor, love, and fidelity to my father and mother. Let's look at those terms, honor. How do you honor someone? Well, very practical terms. How is a basketball team that wins a tournament honored? How is the valedictorian of a school honored? They are set up, aren't they? They are, they are talked about and, and people will commend them what they have done. Well, that's what we do with parents. We, we honor them. They are above us. Not, not that we put them above us. God put them above us. But what we do is we are admitting it. We are agreeing to that. We are saying, yes, my father and mother is above me. My father and mother, they are not equals with me. They are my friends, but they're not my buddies. They're friends. They love me, but they're above me. That's what it means to honor, to acknowledge, to say these people are above me, to honor them. We are to honor our parents and all in authority. We are to love them. You cannot keep the fifth commandment unless you love them. If you do not love your parents, if you do not love your teacher, if you do not love your elders, if you do not love the authorities in the land, you are not keeping this commandment to love them. Love is not just a silly, emotional, warm feeling, but love is a choice. Love is a matter of the will. And it's a specific choice that says, I will seek the good of that person. That's how love manifests itself. I will seek the good of that person. And then if it's a believer, I will not only seek good, but I will seek fellowship with that person. I want to be close to that person. I want to enjoy friendship. This is a matter of our will. This is a decision. I choose to seek their good and to draw close to them. We make every effort to do that. We look for opportunities to do that. We do not go as children off into our room as much as possible and stay away from them. We do not, when the elders call, say, well, I'll return the call when I feel like it. We seek opportunities. We want to be close to those. We want to be seeking their good and loving them. We must honor, hold them up, love, seek their good and seek their fellowship. And fidelity. That will lead to fidelity. Fidelity means simply to be faithful to someone, to be faithful. Husbands and wives must show fidelity to each other. They must be faithful to each other. So must we as children be faithful to our parents, not turn against them. It means that we are true to our parents. We do not speak against them to their face. We do not go around and complain about our parents to our classmates or our friends. We are true to them. If someone would say something bad about our parents, we defend them. We are faithful to them. That's what it means to show fidelity. Now, the manner of doing this is very important. How are we, as children and young people, 
to show all honor, love, and fidelity to our father and mother and all in authority over us. You must see it. Actions speak louder than words. It's not enough merely to say it. You must show it. It must be, therefore, from the heart. I know the world is able to honor father and mother. They can have a special Mother's Day and a special Father's Day. But that's not enough for us. For us, it's seven days a week, every day of the, every week of the year. Showing honor, love, and faithfulness to father and mother and all in authority over us. For God's sake. That's the only way that it's from the heart, is if I do this for God's sake, not that I show my really sweet side to mom because I want to get on her good side, or that I will honor dad greatly because I'm looking to ask a favor, or that I will honor teacher from the outside because I want to have a good grade, or honor the boss because I want to get a little bit more money out of him if I can. Those are all false motives. I must do this because I love God. It comes out of that, that I show honor and love and faithfulness. And because God has set this one over us in our lives. And that's why we submit. The catechism brings that up. And this is a, a bit of a difficult thing to grasp, but let's work at this. How does this work? He says, honor, love, and fidelity to father and mother and all in authority and Submit myself to their good instruction and correction with due obedience. There's two words there. To submit and obey. Two related terms. But there is a bit of difference. When you obey, it means that someone tells you to do something, you hear what they say, and you do it. And then they can say, well, I'm glad to see you obeyed me. You did what you were told to do. Or if I told you not to do it, you didn't do it. You obeyed me. Submission is broader and deeper. Submission normally includes obedience. But submission really includes everything that this Lord's Day is talking about. It means that I put myself under someone deliberately. I put myself under. That's what it means to submit. I submit myself to their good instruction in an orderly way. It includes then that I would honor them, that I would obey them ordinarily. It means that God requires that we always submit to authority. Submit yourself to every ordinance of God. Every single one. Every, of man, rather. Every ordinance of the king. You must submit always. Not to submit would be to rebel against the king. Now here's the difficulty. You must always submit. Always honor and love. And normally that includes obedience. Unless the one in authority would want you to do something that is sinful. Then you may not obey. No matter how much they want you to do that, no matter how much they threaten you to do it, if they want you to do something that is sinful, you may not obey. Your obedience is to God. You still submit to your parents, to the teacher, even to the rulers. You do not say, oh, because you told me to do this, now you're no longer my parents. I don't have to listen to anything that you say any longer. No. So long as they have authority, we submit ourselves. But in that instance, 
we may not obey. And in this terrible, terrible world that we live, saturated with sex, that too is an area that I am loath to bring up. But our children must understand that if there is any teacher or parent who would want sexual sin to be a part of that child's life, the child must disobey, must disobey. And yet, submit, honor, love, and be faithful to all those in authority. This is God glorifying because God put those parents there over us and that teacher and the elders and the rulers of the country. And especially under wicked authority. Then we must keep this commandment too because when the authority is wicked and we still honor them, then the whole world can see a difference in us. They can see the grace that God has given us. Because that's the only way that we will ever keep this commandment is by the grace of God. The fifth commandment is contrary to everything in my nature. I have the nature of Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve were told by God, now there's a tree over there, the tree of life, you eat of that. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of it. And Satan knew exactly what to do. Look at that tree over there, Eve. It's good for eating and you can be like God. Oh, that's rebellion. And she took it. The tree was good to eat and she wanted to be as God. She didn't want to have to listen to God any longer. That's the nature that I'm born with. That's the nature you are born with. And the baby that was baptized this morning has that nature too. That's why baptism is a sign of the washing away of the sins of that nature. It won't be long and this little boy will show the rebelliousness in his nature too. That's what we're born with. So it is our natural inclination to disobey and to dishonor, to set ourselves up. And the only thing that can tame the wretched power of our rebellious nature is God's sovereign grace. God's grace. That changes a heart that is hard and stubborn and rebellious and makes it soft and pliable and willing to will after God's will. God's grace. The grace of God flows to us from the cross of Jesus Christ. In the cross, Jesus Christ Himself learned obedience. He knows how hard it is to obey when there are wicked authorities over Him. He still honored them. He kept this commandment. Even when the wrath of God was pouring out upon him, he kept the commandment. He honored his Father perfectly. He knows how difficult it is. He gives us the grace that we need to be able to honor our parents and our teachers. And the Catechism understands that too. That it's not easy. And that's why the Catechism has to say to us, and also patiently bear with their weaknesses and infirmities. Yes, every single father and every single mother has weaknesses and infirmities. Every teacher, every elder. And God's word to us is, patiently bear with that. Maybe there's a temper. Maybe there is an inability to do something as a parent, as a teacher, a weakness that you can see. 
And our, our nature likes immediately to go to that and say, see, you see why I don't have to listen to that person because that's the way that person is. We need grace. And grace will enable us patiently to bear with the weaknesses and infirmities of those who are in authority over us. And be content. Be content. This is what God has given me. I'm content with that. Pray for them if you need to. I mean, if, if it's coming to that point where you are really struggling to bear with someone's weaknesses, pray for them. Absolutely. Pray for yourself first. That you are able to bear with their weaknesses. And then pray for them. For our mom and dad. For the teachers, for the elders. But you understand, this is the only way that you will experience the blessing of God in the covenant, is by keeping this commandment. And God emphasizes that by adding even a blessing, the only commandment with a blessing added to it. Honor the Lord, thy father and thy mother that it may be well with thee, that's part of what we've been talking about, and that thou mayest live long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And for Israel, that picture was Canaan, but we know, of course, that long life is heaven. But there's the experience of that already here in this life, in the way of obedience to this commandment. In our homes as children, we can enjoy covenant life with God through our parents, through the family life that God gives us. And in the classroom at school and in the congregation when we are submitting to those who are in authority in the home and the school and the church, especially, but also in the world. This is the way that God causes us to enjoy the blessings of heaven already now and here. So honor thy father and thy mother that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy commandments. They are good, and they are perfectly arranged to bless us in our covenant life with thee. We see this this morning, especially in this commandment. Apply it to our hearts, every one of us, that we live gladly in obedience to authority for the name and sake of Jesus Christ. Amen.